of Souls. So it can set Chalice to one, still cast the one drop Merfolk off of Cavern of Souls and get just another busted opening. I think the more important thing here is no copies of Aether Vial. And zero Aether Vials. And no Wastelands, too. Cavern of Souls, the uh, Mistress Factories, and Mutavolts to go along with 13 Islands. On Hoogland's side, again, he has Chalice of the Void times four, which he can play on turn one via Mox Diamond. Has Death Rite Shaman, four Dark Confidants, three Night of the Reliquaries. So removal spells and Abrupt Decay, Diabolic Leader, and Dismember. Just one Green Sun Zenith, a couple copies of Loam, only two. Four Living Wish, two Sylvan Library. This is a deck that we have seen Jeff actually make a couple of top eights with before. Yeah, no, he has a, actually quite a bit of a legacy resume i think he's more known for his standard brewing but he has a couple top eights with strategies along these lines he's gonna start with a fetch land which is verdant catacombs go down to 19 search out a land and play a death right shaman so again if you're familiar with just work which derek may or may not be this is something that he has kind of done before but oftentimes we actually see the punishing fire uh grove of the burwells engine which would be absurd in this matchup but he doesn't have it this go around a little more creature oriented yeah so smith with the curse catcher already revealing exactly what deck he is playing Hoogland has not done the same just yet. Of course, everybody at home does know what he's playing. We'll see if Smith is able to figure it out rather quickly here. This is the cost of the no vile strategy. It's a lot of double blue two drops, only 13 islands and four cavern souls. Rigor really not going to be able to cast things. Yeah, as good as a card as Mutavolt is, Smith would rather that be something that can tap for blue or be a cavern of souls so he can start dumping those two mana lords into play, but he can't do it just yet. So Hoogland is going to go down to 18 via Windswept Teeth, search up a land, and we'll see what he wants to cast in the second turn of the game. D depends how much he wants to play around days, really. These Merfolk decks typically play quite a few. There's actually zero copies in Derek's list. Yeah, this list is, again, a little bit unorthodox, but it has been seeing some success lately on the Open series. Now the Reliquary is going to resolve because Hoogland doesn't have to play around days. So... In comes the knight, and now Smith, just with a curse catcher, looking again, I believe, for another blue source, but he's found one now. And this is a, a, a pretty much a legacy rule here. If you are not able to kill Knight of the Reliquary, nor able to kill your opponent very quickly, Knight of the Reliquary will dominate the game in legacy. Hoogland going to untap on his third turn, draws a copy of Mox Diamond. You can see he has a Thespian stage in his hand. The big question is, does he have Dark Depths in his deck? And he does have two copies. So he has a way to close out the games very, very quickly. Looks like he's going to, oh, casting a spell here. It's going to be a copy of Living Wish. One of the more maligned wishes in Legacy. And Living Wish is a card that Derek is going to look at, and we will as well. Actually, one of my favorite cards when I was a kid. I'm going to search for a creature or land. Yeah, I would never want to do either of those things for two mana. <laughs> tough crowd, tough crowd. Yeah, it's Other true. Game, screen, so he does search up, I believe, in depths. He's going to activate this, go through his deck. It's time to get a Cavern of Souls. Jeff, what are you up to? What's going on over there? You don't mind me asking. What are you doing? Three mana, maybe another. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what he wished up was Norzov Pontiff, and now that's going to kill those Merfolks. So, okay then. All right. Fair enough. Was not expecting that. I don't think Derek was either. Probably not, no. <laughs> I guess that's one way to take care of Trinity Nemesis. Now, uh, Jeff should have this pretty much locked up next turn. Uh, yeah, I would think that that is the case. Pretty good wish target there for Jeff. He can also search up Vampire, Hexmage, Dark Depths, Pajuka Bog, Maze of Ith, another Knight of the Reliquary, Phyrexian Revoker, Kusali Pride Mage, Gaddic Teague, Peacekeeper. Ooh, Peacekeeper is nice. Also a delight in this matchup, as I don't think Burful can really beat it. Uh, nope. Yep. Neither can Elves. Yeah, also true. Well, add Deathrite Shaman action. It is very hard. Yeah, it's very, okay. All right, all right. I'll give you that one. It is hard. Jeff's spinning the tires here, trying to figure out what he can do. It looks like, yeah, just passing of the turn seems to be the safest route here and can work his way towards putting a 20-20 into play. Very unlikely that Murphle can beat this, so no reason for Jeff to do anything fancy. He's got abrupt decay as defense in case something weird happens. Yeah, there are times here where Merfolk may have a card like Unsummon or Vapor Snag, but those are, those are very few and far between. And again, if you know the updated lists of Merfolk that have uh, Cavern of Souls and Chalice of the Void, that would stop their game plan altogether. Here's a true name nemesis. Also likely that we would have seen an Unsummon on this Knight of the Reliquary a little while ago. Yeah. So here is a floating of a green mana, and then Knight of the Reliquary activation. 
So one green floating. Of course, here is Dark Depths. That's going to just going to copy it. And this interaction is a pretty unique one. Yeah, you copy the Dark Depths, and then you have a Dark Depths with zero counters on it, because that's what you copies the land. Then you get a Merit Lage, and then a Merit Lage kills your opponent. Fun. The end. Winner, winner, Jeff Hoogland dinner. He does win game number one here. Up over Derek Smith, Jun Depths, excuse me, Junk Depths, up a game over Merfolk. Uh, Derek, looking at a sideboard here, a Luan, Cephalid Empress, two Null Rods, a Pithy Needle, two copies of Thorn of Amethyst, two Tormod Scripts, two copies of Dismember, two Echoing Troops, two Negates, and one Graft Digger's Cage. I think that he will bring in the two copies of Dismember and the Pithy Needle. Just things to fight creatures with activated abilities and a couple of removal spells for some of the troublesome threats that Jeff brings to the table. On the other side of things, again, Jeff has a lot of one-ofs for this Living Wish engine, so I don't expect to see him sideboard a lot of cards. Um, the non-Living Wish targets, in theory, I, of course, Thalia can be searched for, but he has three of those, I imagine, for his combo matchups. Uh, to go along with the Golgari Charm and a Choke, I actually think the Charm is pretty good here for the same reason that Orzhov Pontiff is good. Yeah. So I can see him bringing that in. The Choke must be nice. Well, not sure he needs it, but... Yeah, it's, it's not always great against Burfolk, too. It's very good against Darius List, potentially, because he doesn't have Vile. But I don't really know about Golgari Charm in the matchup. I think the board that you saw there is the exception rather than the rule. If Derek gets some Lords going, Golgari Charm is going to be a lot worse. So high upside, and the floor is quite low, too. Again, the one-ofs here that Jeff can't search for, it could potentially sideboard into his deck. He has a Vampire Hex Mage along with a Dark Depth, so that kind of combo hanging out on the board. Um, Pajuka Bog. For the dredge matchups, Maze of If. He's got another Reliquary to search for, along with three copies in the main deck, so a virtual seven. A Phyrexian Revoker, Kosali Pride Mage, a Get Teague, the Pontiff that we saw, and the old Peacekeeper. The Peacekeeper is nice. Yes, it is. It really is. I'm and Derek a big with, fan. Derek with a couple answers in his sideboard here. Two copies of Echoing Truth and two copies of Dismember, but he is dead to a Peacekeeper game one. Yeah. That's, I mean, I actually remember, I mean, it's crazy to say years ago, but it feels like since it is 2014, around like 2010, 2011, people actually went to Peacekeeper to beat Murphy. Yes. That was actually a strategy that people used, and that's actually one of the things that makes Legacy great is you can dig through those old sets and find a way to beat someone. The Peacekeeper is also nonsense. But that's, I, I, I really like the designs. Uh, I'm trying to think of the one that I saw. Um, Kevin Verhey of R&D has been posting an old magic calendar where it shows some odd design. It's a calendar from way back in the day and has a design and... Uh, you know, a little description or some strategy tips with it, whatever. But there's this one card that's blue, white, two for my sage. <laughs> All planes become mountains. This is glaciers. Yeah, glaciers. All planes become mountains. Upkeep of a blue and a white. When this card's in play, your opponent, if you're casting it, it's probably because your opponent can't play the game when it's in play. So why does it have an upkeep cost? Kind of random, right? It's like, <laughs> sure. you're, now, all right, so you can't cast any spells for the rest of the game, but I had to pay two minutes a turn. It's like, what, what does that even matter? Like, you have, <laughs> I can't cast anything. Peacekeeper, very similar. <laughs> you can't attack. You cannot I, do anything. I have to pay. Some percentage of decks can't, you can't, if I'm casting this against you, it's probably because you can't beat it. It's a one card win, but I do have to spend two mana every turn. <laughs> Makes it feel fair, no? Yeah. No, I pay the cost. And you I, continually pay the cost. Yeah. I have to pay this every turn. Don't you understand? Also, Peacekeeper having a point of power is nonsense, yeah. too. <laughs> is that thing going beatdowns? It's, you know, out in the savannah somewhere. There's like a giraffe in the background. The text box is creatures can't attack. <laughs> perhaps it should have been an 01. Maybe. Yeah, an 01 makes a little more sense. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. You never know. You can't make it just angry enough. Yeah. Jeff with... A pretty good start here. That's being Sage into a Mox's Diamond and then a Dark Confidant. Look at him go. Very good opening against Burfolk, too. Derek, without that many ways to kill creatures out of Jeff's deck, and they are very taxed because neither the Reliquary can, can't really go unchecked either. There's a factory. This is a Silver Guild Adept. Time to cantrip. What will the reveal be? It'll be another copy of Curse Catcher. So a new card coming here for Smith. And of course, an attack from one here is pretty safe as Hoogland will not be blocking. So down to 19 goes Jeff with the potential for a little bit more as Dark Confidant will reveal another the Reliquary. Down to 16, Hoogland will go, but he's probably happy with that reveal. As long as he can cast it this turn, oh. I, th I think it's worthwhile. I think the land that he drew is going to be able to help that Scrubland into a Knight, which is currently a 3-3 with a land in the graveyard, of course. This puts Derek to the test. Really, He needs a Lord or a Dismember basically this turn to continue to play. Yeah, could go 2020 style real fast. Derek does play an island. 
And, you know, truthfully, I think this is the direction that these Maverick-esque decks need to go. Now the Reliquary needs to be able to search up the combo kill of Dark Dust Espion Stage pretty quickly so you can have a better game against the combo matchups. This deck kind of preys historically on creature decks yeah. at the cost of the combo matchups, but Thespian Sage plus Dark Depths gives it some shot at beating the unfair decks as well because you can kill so quickly. So there's a Trian Nemesis, as powerful as that card is. Doesn't beat a 2020 Avatar token. Jeff draws a Verdant Catacombs for Bob and then a Cavern of Souls for his draw step and simply going to pass the turn back and threaten the 2020 and see if Derek can do anything about it. So Smith is going to draw a card for the turn. It's a Force of Will. Typically a good card, but not great right now. Phantasmal Image in the hand as well. But none of these cards are really helping the Merfolk player. So going to start by attacking here for three. Who will go down to 13 since he can't block? And I'm sure Jeff is going to put him to the test right now. Might as well. If anything, if, if, I mean, if it works out, it's game over. And if not, we'll just keep playing Magic. And normally when your opponent's shuffling their hand around like this, it means, you know, they're trying to figure something out. Something that isn't there. Phantasmal Image going to come into play. Going to copy True Name. That's a combo, see? Yes. So you can't target it? Right. You're the opponent. You can't. That's True Name. You got right. it. Okay. There's Cozy's Trickster. Somewhere Greg Hatch is smiling. Yeah, let's flight home back to Los Angeles. And Hoogland with the Green Sun Zenith in hand, so the combo could come ah, up. Ah, yes, the double shuffle. Jeff looking here. May want to respond to the Cozy's Trickster by making a 2020. There would be a lot of a, there would lot be a lot of a shuffling here in searching of the deck. So Jeff is going to float. Search, much like game number two, I think it's time to go get a Dark Depths token and get this thing over with. And I think that Jeff gave some pause here. Uh, uh, what's the card that Derek could realistically have here to interact? It's probably Submerge. Yep. So just wants to be careful in that last spot. Yep. And he is able to get the job done. So Jeff Hoogland is going to win this match with his Junk Depths deck, taking down Derek Smith playing Merfolk, moving on to 7-1 and one, and that much closer to the elimination rounds. We barely hit 10 rounds today, so actually...